This is part three of the Ironclads of the Civil War series. Make sure you check out the first two parts before continuing as the series moves in chronological order. What led us to where we are now? Well, the first parts were about the creation of the American Ironclads for the Civil War, the USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia, the Virginia also going by the more popular name, the Merrimack. In part three, we are going to get into the first voyage and the battle between the two new super weapons and how these amazing vessels left their lasting mark on history. Sit back, relax, and take in part three of Ironclads of the Civil War. Hello, and welcome to the Spark History Show, where we bring history to light. Take a dive with us into history and hear the real accounts of the stories of the past as they actually unfolded. Explore with us as we shine some light on the amazing events that shaped our world into what we have today. We are going to recreate the stories of the past to better understand the struggles and triumphs during the most epic moments in history. This is the Spark History Show. Let us begin the journey. The voyage that the Monitor took to the strategic body of water called Hampton Roads ended up being a perilous one. The Monitor needed to make haste to the location to help the Union stop the South's ironclad, the Virginia, from dismantling the Union blockade of the South. On March 7, 1862, just a day or so into their journey south from New York, the Monitor and the ships traveling with her encountered heavy seas. The men enclosed in this iron box that was the Monitor began to come down with seasickness as they were tossed around endlessly inside the ship by the large swells of the ocean. The air was stifling on board the ship as it only had limited ventilation and all of the men worked, ate, and slept in cramped quarters. The sea progressively got worse as the day went on. The companion ships, the Sachem and the Curatuck, could be seen in the distance with the tips of their cannons being doused into the water as the ships rocked from side to side with the waves. The pilot house on the monitor, which was like a little box protruding from the front part of the ship, was smashed with waves as the sea broke on the bow of the vessel. Water would come crashing through the viewport with enough force to knock the sailor steering the vessel away from the wheel of the ship, or what is known as the helm in naval terms. The waves started to get so high that they were actually topping the very turret of the ship. The men feared the entire ship would be swamped and be engulfed by the sea. The smokestacks, which were included only for the voyage and not combat, now had water coming in over the top. This meant that seawater was being dumped into the exhaust of the engine. To give you an idea of just how large the waves were, the smokestacks themselves were six feet tall and placed on top of the monitor's deck, which was already above the waterline. With water entering the vessel all over the ship in the rough seas, and with the exhaust and the blowers not functioning properly, more and more parts of the ship began to malfunction. The seawater loosened the fan belts that turned the blowers, and this caused the exhaust to start backing up. This meant that carbon monoxide, a byproduct of the coal engine, was starting to build up in the ship. Carbon monoxide is a tasteless and odorless gas that, when inhaled, starves the body of oxygen by filling in the space in our blood that the oxygen molecules would normally enter. Many households of today use carbon monoxide detectors in their basement to detect if there is a life-threatening amount of carbon monoxide in the air. In a home, there is the potential for a furnace malfunction, which fills the basement with a deadly gas. If someone is in the room, all of a sudden they will start to feel lightheaded and eventually pass out from inhaling the carbon monoxide in the air. Without the alarm in their homes, people were known to have died in their sleep, unaware that the carbon monoxide levels were increasing, which led to their own suffocation. Sailors scrambled to get to the higher parts of the ship before they passed out and suffocated from the low lingering gas. The ship eventually had to be towed to shallower waters by their accompanying vessels, where the sea was less rough and they were then able to vent the excess gases that had built up. 
As they were being towed, the whole crew of around 50 men grouped tightly together on top of the turret of the ship, which was the only place to breathe fresh air. The crew of the monitor had to pump the water out of the inside of their ship, and when that wasn't enough, they even formed a bucket line where one man would scoop up a bucket full of water and would hand it off to the next man beside him, and so on, until the last man at the end of the line would be above decks and dump the water outside. Eventually, they were able to get the ship back in order. The bad weather and light repairs took the course of a day, and with the next sunrise on March 8th, the sea started to become calmer as the clouds cleared. The monitor was able to once again continue on its voyage to Hampton Roads. The vessel was traveling at a slow pace of around 5 knots, or 5.75 miles per hour for all you landlubbers out there. By around 2 p.m. on March 8th, the monitor was within 15 miles of Hampton Roads. The Virginia would need to come through the Straits of Hampton Roads from the original position on the Elizabeth River near Gosport Naval Yard in order to gain an outlet to the open sea and be able to attack other Union defensive points. To imagine the terrain of land around Hampton Roads, think of the letter L as the shape of the land. Now take that long straight line forming the top of the L shape and bend it back away from the lower part of the L as if you are in a chair and rocking back in it about 10 degrees. To get to the mouth of the intersecting rivers at Hampton Roads, the monitor had to sail around and under Adams Island on the north side and above Cape Henry to the south. Cape Henry in our example would be the tip of the lower line extending to the right in our L shape. This was a spit of land that jutted out the farthest into the sea. Now the focal point of Hampton Roads would be located in the center of our backward leaning vertical line. If you cut a swash out of the center of the vertical line of the L, this would be where the outlet of the rivers opens up into the wider ocean. It is at this point where the Union base named Fort Monroe was situated to guard the strait where all naval vessels would have to traverse to reach the open sea from the inland rivers. This was the prime strategic location in the area, and both sides knew it. The area around Hampton Roads maintained a naval blockade of Union ships, some of which had been earlier evacuated from the Gosport Naval Yard when it was overrun by the Confederates. To protect their newly acquired dry dock and naval base, the Southerners created a common barrier across water that had been used since ancient times by sinking debris in the channel leading to the harbor, blocking off access to enemy ships. The shallow water of the Elizabeth River meant that obstructions could be sunk on the route and this would prevent any ships from trying to traverse the river. Normally, in a river you have a channel that is dug out near the center where the water can be made the deepest. This allows larger vessels to be able to traverse river passages without running aground or striking the bottom. To the size of this channel or pathway in the center usually marked with buoys, the depth of the water would gradually be reduced more and more moving towards the shoreline and edge of the river. By planting debris in the channel, if the enemy tried to go through the shipping channel, they would crash into the debris and be unable to pass. If they tried to go around the channel, they would run aground along the shallow banks of the river. Either way, they would be left potentially immobilized and vulnerable. When the Virginia was nearing completion, the Confederates went and cleared the debris ahead of time so that the Virginia could steam out of the river and towards the sea. To get towards the open ocean, the Virginia had to steer through a body of water called Hampton Roads, where multiple rivers met into a body of water before running into the ocean. It is in this setup around the strategic Hampton Roads area that a great naval confrontation was bound to occur. For the Virginia to get out to the open ocean and then have the potential to head towards the Union capital in Washington, D.C., it would first have to break the Union blockade and then get past Fort Monroe before reaching an outlet to the ocean. The Confederate Secretary of the Navy envisioned the Virginia not only destroying the blockade, but also of sailing up the Chesapeake and then Potomac River and destroying the important bridges to the Union capital in Washington, D.C. It was also realized that if the Virginia could make it to the open sea, she could even head to New York City and take on the Union deep within her own territory. Such a blow to the Union could make a peace treaty a more acceptable proposition to the North and enable the sustained existence of a Confederate States of America. 
For the Monitor, the area around Fort Monroe had increased in significance because it is where Union generals wanted to launch their offensive on the important strategic Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. Richmond was declared the Confederate capital in May of 1861 after it was transferred from Montgomery, Alabama, where it had originally been when the Confederacy initiated. Being in Virginia and so close to the Northern Territories, it made it an even more enticing target for the Union than the previous capital. With the rivers and nearby land controlled, the North could bring in troops by boat and use Fort Monroe as a staging point for an invasion of Richmond. While the Monitor had been rushing south towards Hampton Roads, the Virginia had departed from Gosport and was making its way along the Elizabeth River. At 11 a.m. on March 8th, a signal gun had been sounded to mark the departure of the ironclad for battle. People from all of the nearby towns proceeded to travel along the banks of the river to try and grab a seat for the spectacle that was about to unfold. Men, women, children, they all marched to the shores of the river to catch a glimpse of this amazing new machine. The first voyage of the American superweapons had become a spectator affair. The Confederate Army forces also headed to the waterfront to see this new mechanical contraption in action. There were several escort ships for the Virginia that would also assist in the upcoming battle. Other steamships ran alongside the Virginia as it traveled through the river such as the Raleigh and the Beaufort, which were smaller steamships compared to what the powerful Union Navy fielded. The Beaufort also assisted the ironclad with navigation through the river with a tow line. In this way, they could more easily steer the ship than the Virginia's rudder trying to work in the shallow waters. Captain Buchanan of the Virginia already had his plans for attack. They were to take on the ships Cumberland and Congress anchored outside of Newport News, Virginia. These would be their first targets in the blockade as they exited the Elizabeth River into the large body of water of Hampton Roads. This is where all of the rivers we had spoken about earlier came together to form a large open body of water like a bay. Confederate intelligence had stated that the USS Cumberland had a powerful 70-pound cannon on board the ship that had the potential to penetrate the ironclad's armor. Buchanan's thought was to ram the Cumberland instead of engaging in a long, drawn-out series of broadsides with the ship that might enable the Cumberland's cannon to penetrate the ironclad's armor. The Virginia had been fitted with a ram at the bow for just such a purpose, and Buchanan wanted to test just how effective it could be. On March 8th, the Virginia made its way into the open water around Hampton Roads, leaving behind it the Elizabeth River. Coming out into the open under full steam, the men on board the Virginia could see the USS Cumberland and the USS Congress at anchor to their northwest in a protective stance guarding the mainland of Newport News, Virginia. Two more Union naval ships, the Roanoke and the Minnesota, were farther off on their right side to the northeast, guarding the position around Hampton Roads and Fort Monroe. Captain Buchanan of the Virginia was ready to initiate his plan. He gathered the men from the ship around him on the gun deck and spoke to them of the honor and obligation that they had to do their duty as members of the Confederate Navy. The drummer then began to beat to quarters. Brum da dum, brum da dum, brum da dum da dum. Everyone hurriedly split off into their battle positions and brought their stations to the ready. It was time for war. Buchanan had his ship steer west and directly towards the USS Cumberland. The plan was to charge in and engage the Cumberland and the Minnesota before the ships near Fort Monroe could reach them in aid. The engine in the Virginia was powering full steam ahead towards their targets. From the Virginia, the men strained to see the status of the Union ships. Not fully prepared for an engagement on this day, the Union ships were seen with their clothes that had been recently washed still drying in the air along the sides of the ship. The lifeboats were lowered down into the water and had been ferrying people to and from shore. As the iron monster began to bear down on them, sailors on the Cumberland began to take notice. The clothes were quickly torn down. The lifeboats were locked back into their proper position. Signal flags flew up the mass of the ship to inform the other members of the Union Navy that the Virginia, or what they called the Merrimack, had arrived. Men peeked out of the gun ports to gain a closer view of the Merrimack as it bore down on them. None of the men had ever before seen such a contraption of iron and weaponry traversing the water. 
Seeing the signals from the other ships, the Roanoke and the Minnesota also started to make preparations for battle. In a short while, smoke started spewing out of their smokestacks as they prepared as quickly as possible to get under steam and underway. Ships in this time didn't just have a throttle to a gas engine like we do today, where they could instantly head off at full speed. On steamships, the boiler would have to be lit, fuel would have to be added, and then the fire inside the furnace would have to heat up water hot enough to create steam that would then be used to power the ship. The process took some time to complete, and in the meantime, the Virginia was bearing down on the Cumberland. As the Virginia traveled north, civilians from the south gathered on the shores around the Confederate weapons batteries that protected the mainland and cheered away as they saw their mighty superweapon power on towards the Union forces. The ironclad had developed an audience. Part of the irony of the upcoming battle was that several crew members on board the CSS Virginia had previously served in the Federal Navy on board the ship that they were now heading towards with the intent to destroy. The USS Cumberland had once been their homes where they manned and protected the ship in the Union Navy before the onset of the Civil War. They were going against what had once been their very livelihood. Each side in the Civil War, countrymen against countrymen, was now fighting for a cause that conflicted with the other. With their views and beliefs now conflicting with the Union Navy they had once protected with the onset of the Civil War, they were pitted against the ship and the Navy that they had once fought with their lives to defend. When Buchanan and the Virginia turned west to take on the enemy ships, it was about 1.30. By 2 p.m., they were within firing range of the Cumberland. The first shots were fired by a small tug called the Zouave on the Union side and from the Beaufort on the Confederate side, who fired before receiving orders to do so. I guess they were so anxious to get into battle, or maybe they just wanted their name to be first in the history books. The Virginia's escort ships, the Raleigh and the Beaufort, kept along the left or port side of the ironclad, placing the metal ship between them and the enemy to provide cover. The ironclad herself was focused on her mission and did not open fire on the other smaller Union escort ships as they were focused on meeting their main target, the warship Cumberland. As they neared the Cumberland, the gun at the bow of the Virginia was primed and ready. The weapons crew took aim, and then the men stopped. They looked over at Captain Buchanan and awaited his order. Buchanan looked back over at his men and gave them the signal to fire, and the mighty ironclad fired her first shot of the battle at the enemy. Keep in mind that the Virginia was basically an iron box, and when that shot erupted out of the cannon, the deafening sound of the explosion reverberated through the entire innards of the ship, ringing the men's eardrums. With the cannons of the ship firing, the inside of the ship would become a loud and dirty area as the gunpowder in the cannons ignited in a blaze of fire, smoke, and explosions to launch projectiles at the enemy. As the Confederate ships drew nearer to the enemy, they were also bombarded by Union naval batteries on the shore around Newport News, Virginia, where the Cumberland and Congress were positioned. The Cumberland and the Congress had been anchored around 300 yards off of the nearby shore. The Virginia powered on toward her prey, the Cumberland. The first shot that she had fired crashed into the deck of the enemy ship, setting wooden splinters in all directions, injuring a number of men on board the ship. The ironclad ignored the small Union ships as well as the shore batteries that were firing ordnance at her and continued onward toward her target. The Cumberland launched their first shot back at the Virginia, but it missed the ship and they began to scramble to get the cannon primed to fire again. In the meantime, the Virginia had now closed in the range to make an easy target of the Cumberland and again fired their forward cannon. The shot exploded across the reloading gun of the Cumberland, destroying the weapon and killing or disabling the entire gun crew. As the Virginia neared the Cumberland, the USS Congress took up position to aid her sister ship and fire a broadside at the Virginia. The Union sailors were silent on the ship, every sailor looking on in awe at the ironclad, waiting for the order to engage. As their positioning was just right, the Congress fired and unloaded a full broadside of all of their cannons into the Virginia. The side of the ship roared with the sound of the explosions as the fury of cannon fire was let loose at the Virginia. Once the smoke from the broadside slowly dissipated, the Union sailors looked on in fear and disbelief as their mighty broadside had no discernible effect on the Confederate ship. 
All of the projectiles had glanced off the armor, and there were no visible signs of serious damage from the barrage. The Congress continued to fire at the ironclad with the hope of somehow getting through its tough armor. When the Congress had engaged the ironclad with their broadside, it also opened them up to return fire. The Virginia had its four cannons prepared for their own broadside against the Congress as she came into their sights. The cannons of the Virginia were loaded with something called hot shot or heated shot, which were small iron spheres that looked like miniature cannonballs, which were heated to red hot temperatures in the furnace of the ship. Several of the miniature cannonballs would be loaded into the cannon as they were still glowing red hot from the intense heat that they had received from the furnace. A severe weakness of the Union ships was that they were entirely made of wood, which is an extremely flammable material. The Confederates planned to exploit this Union weakness by making use of the hotshot ordnance on their ironclad and launch burning rounds of iron at the Union ships to set them ablaze. Once the Virginia had their cannons perfectly lined up, they lit loose with a salvo of hotshot into the hull of the Congress. The burning hot iron crashed into the ship and immediately started multiple fires on board the vessel. As the Virginia continued head-on toward the Cumberland, the Congress and the Virginia continued to trade broadsides. But the Congress was taking severe damage and was on fire, while the ordnance from the Congress was not able to puncture the ironclad ship. The armor was again proving effective at stopping the broadsides and cannon fire from the enemy. Captain Buchanan had the Cumberland in his sights in front of his bow and was fully prepared to ram the ship. An order was sent out to be ready for full reverse to back away from the Union ship after she had been struck by the Virginia's ram. The Cumberland unloaded her cannons on the ironclad steaming toward her. The sailors on the Cumberland knew that they would not be able to get out of the way of the enemy's ship and were going to be hit. They fired and reloaded as fast as they could, but the shells would either glance off the angled sides of the Virginia and fly into the air behind it, or they would thud into the enemy ship and then drop down into the sea, spitting steam as the ordnance, burning hot from the explosion of the cannon, fell down into the cool water below. Each of the rounds that hit the Virginia would echo, echo, echo through the ship as if you were hitting a stick on the side of a tin pail. It must have been pretty intense for the men of the ship, knowing that at any moment one of those shells could find a weak point in the armor and punch through, ending their existence. For the time being, the Confederate sailors were safe, as the armor held and the enemy shots were having minimal impact. The Cumberland was able to destroy the flagstaff and smokestack of the Virginia, but not damage any critical components of the ship. The Virginia was traveling at a speed of six knots and was almost at the side of the Cumberland, charging through the heavy enemy fire. The smoke from all the cannons blocked a clear line of sight. And then BOOM! The forward ram of the Virginia smacked into the Cumberland, shredding the timbers of the hull and driving deep into the ship. The ram opened a hole about seven feet in diameter in the Cumberland, below the waterline, and water began to flood into the lower compartments of the ship. The Virginia had already thrown their engines into reverse trying to depart from the now doomed Cumberland. No ship would be able to survive after such a large breach below the waterline. The men on the Cumberland had prepared for the incoming ram and maintained their positions on their guns, continually firing at the Virginia at point-blank range now that she was lodged into their ship. The Virginia was having trouble pulling away as the ram was securely lodged into the enemy ship. Her armor continued to hold true, and she was able to take the fire from the enemy ship, as well as return some of her own. While the Confederates continued to try and break free, the Cumberland began listing toward the opening in her hull, clamping down even more on the Virginia, as the Cumberland tilted more and more on top of the Virginia's bow, driving it downward. If the Virginia was not able to break free, the weight of the Cumberland sinking might pull the entire ship down with the doomed vessel. In the rush to construct the Virginia, there had actually been a defect in the ram where it was cracked when trying to be installed and the damage was left unrepaired. This turned out to be both a good and bad oversight. With the Virginia losing her forward momentum after ramming the Cumberland, the current of the water started to push the Virginia towards a parallel position with the Cumberland, with the bow of the ship still wedged into the front hull of the Cumberland. The starboard side of the Virginia came right alongside the port side of the Cumberland. This motion created quite a bit of torque on the ram head, and coupled with the full reverse of her engines, the ironclad was able to break free from the sinking Cumberland. 
The problem was that the ship broke free by having the ram itself split into two and break away from the hull of the Virginia where the defect was located. This left behind the mighty ram that the Confederates had envisioned would plow through the entire Union Navy. But the loss of the ram enabled their vessel to be able to pull away from the Cumberland and not be brought down to the depths with her. The good part was that they would not be sinking due to being stuck in the Cumberland and still maintained their fully effective cannon broadsides. The loss of the ram ended up working out all right for them. Large ships usually don't instantly sink once they have been dealt a severe blow. They slowly fill with water and gradually descend into the abyss of the ocean as their pumps can't overcome the ever-increasing amounts of water flowing into the damaged hull. Eventually, the added weight of the water compromises the buoyancy of the ship and it sinks. The Cumberland and Virginia continue to trade volleys of cannon fire with one another as the Virginia maintained a position parallel to the Cumberland. The engagement was fierce and bloody for the Cumberland. The men of the ship were being torn to bits with the point-blank volleys of cannon fire from the ironclad as they continued to fight as their ship quickly took on more and more water. The Cumberland's crew continued to fight with honor knowing of the immediate threat that the ironclad presented to the Union and did anything they could to somehow damage the ship in the time they had left before their own vessel sunk. No matter how many shots were fired, they just couldn't penetrate the Virginia's strong iron armor. The Cumberland continued to list and slowly sink deeper into the water. For half an hour, the cannon fire between the ships continued, barraging each other with shells and shrapnel. Disabled and injured men who had been brought to the medical facilities below decks on the Cumberland began to drown as the water level increasingly filled the hull of the ship. Eventually, the ship reached a point where there were barely any cannons left operational and undamaged or even enough of a crew to man them. Captain Morris of the Cumberland made the call that no captain ever wants to hear come from his own lips. Abandon ship. The time was around 3.45 p.m. and the Cumberland was to be left to the sea. Although the Union shots had not been able to penetrate the armor of the Confederate ironclad, they were able to severely damage two of the 12 cannons on board the Virginia by managing to hit into the gun ports of the ironclad. These were the small window-like openings that the ship used to present their guns and fire at the enemy. The components on the outside of the ironclad, including the lifeboats, the anchor, and the deck railings, were all completely obliterated. A few of the men inside were injured during the battle, but the ship itself was still ready to continue the fight. Now that the first threat was dealt with, Buchanan and his men regained their composure to turn and confront the USS Congress. Due to the positioning of the ironclad, when they rammed the Cumberland, the ship was now facing towards the James River or the northwest area of Hampton Roads. They quickly got up to steam by heading up towards the James River a bit and then started a long and slow turnaround to face the enemy. The shallow waters meant that the bottom of the ship dragged along the bottom of the channel, further hindering their slow turn. The Congress now had to prepare for their inevitable engagement with the ironclad. At first, there was a feeling of confidence. No less than three other Union warships were en route to the Congress's location to aid in the upcoming battle. The Congress herself was on fire but still able to put up a fight. As the Union crew watched the ironclad turn around and set course for their ship, the members of the Congress also saw a contingent of ships under the Confederate commander John R. Tucker breaking through the fire from the shore batteries at Newport News to assist the Virginia. Two of the ships were able to make it past the barrage to take up position behind the Virginia. Now, as this was occurring, the Union ships that had been coming to aid the Congress managed to slowly run aground one at a time en route to the Congress in the shallow channels of Hampton Roads and were stuck in place. Effectively taken out of combat, they were just stuck aground too far away to do significant damage upon the enemy with their cannons. The Congress had signaled for another ship, the Zouave, to assist by helping to tow her to shallow waters, hopefully escaping the Virginia's pursuit. By around 4 p.m., the Virginia had taken up a position behind the Congress and began to fire at the Union ship as it tried to reach the shallows where the Virginia hopefully could not pursue. Shots from the Virginia blasted away at the stern of the frigate, taking out the rear-facing guns and causing fires to erupt. The Virginia closed in to a range of around 200 yards, guns blazing. 
The Zouav and the Congress had iron shells raining down on them. The Congress was left with no way to defend herself, with no rear-facing cannons left operational and fires scattered throughout the ship. While the Congress was moving away from the Virginia, the crew had misjudged the depth of the water and ended up running the ship aground. The entire stern of the Congress was laid to ruin by the Confederates' broadsides. For nearly an hour, the Virginia pounded away at the Congress. The Confederate ships under John R. Tucker also arrived on the scene and assisted in the attack on the Union ship. The Congress had no hope to survive the engagement and made the decision to surrender. The mighty Congress lowered her colors and raised the white flag, which in naval terms allowed all the surrounding ships to see that the Congress had capitulated. The Zouave cut away the tow lines to the Congress and made fast for the sister Union ships that had also run aground, leaving behind the lost Congress. The Confederate ships Raleigh and Beaufort moved alongside the Congress to accept the surrender and take prisoners. The next events help highlight the sad truth of war. The Union soldiers on the nearby shoreline decided to disregard the fact that their fellowship had surrendered and the standard maritime engagement protocol that it invoked, which would allow the Confederates to commandeer the surrendered ship and take the crew as prisoners. This was to enable a sense of humanity during war so that wounded and prisoners on both sides could be afforded a chance at life rather than be mercilessly destroyed by their enemy. The Union soldiers on the shore, some of which were men that had rowed to safety from the sinking Cumberland, took this opportunity for revenge and opened fire on the Confederate ships pulled up alongside the Congress. Three of the shore batteries fired their cannons at the Confederates while sharpshooters lined the waterline, taking pot shots at the Confederate ships. The grape shot that was fired from the shore cannons tore into both the Confederate and Union ships, causing casualties on both sides. The Confederate ship Beaufort couldn't sustain the fire from the shore, and Captain Parker frantically blew into his whistle, signaling to all his men to make haste back aboard their ship from their boarding action on the Cumberland. Parker's men leapt back onto their ship, and with the prisoners and wounded that they had already extracted from the Congress, got underway as quickly as possible to get away from the firing of the shore batteries. The Beaufort had many men and officers that were injured by the surprise attack, which was in complete violation of the Congress's surrender and terms of naval engagement. Captain Buchanan, back on board the Virginia, did not realize what was happening at first. The Beaufort was leaving the side of the Congress, and Buchanan assumed that they had taken the crew captive and had set fire to the ship to destroy it. But something was wrong. The ship stood there, safe and sound, not taking up in a fiery blaze. Had Parker and the Beaufort not completed their mission and left the surrendered ship without setting fire to it? It could be easily repaired by the Union and brought back to fight the Confederates. Buchanan quickly ordered another member of his crew, a man named Miner, to take some of his men on the last remaining rowboat that the Virginia had and accomplish the task of setting the Congress alight so that the fire would destroy any chance for the ship to continue to be a threat in the war. An accompanying Confederate ship, Teaser, followed alongside the rowboat with Miner and his men. Once the small rowboat got within close range of the Congress, the Union shore batteries set their sights upon them and opened up, releasing cannons and bullets flying past the tiny vessel. Three of the men on board were hit, including Miner. The small rowboat offered almost no protection from cannon fire. The nearby ship Teaser was able to come to the rescue and pull aboard the men from the smaller vessel to relative safety after they frantically rowed toward the ship to get out of the maelstrom of bullets. With the men from the rowboat safely on board, the Teaser signaled back to the Virginia what had happened with the surprise attack. Receiving the message on the Virginia, Buchanan became enraged. His blood boiled that the Union troops disregarded the surrender and killed his men in this surprise attack. He yelled out, DESTROY THAT SHIP! The Virginia threw fuel into their boilers. Smoke billowed out of the engines of the ship and into the air above, and the vessel moved to a firing position to the rear of the Congress. The Virginia opened up with broadsides of hot shot on the Congress, and flames began to shoot out of the ship as the burning hot iron shells burst through the wooden hull of the Congress. In his rage, Buchanan grabbed a rifle and proceeded to run to the top deck outside of the protection of the ironclad's armor and began to fire at the 50 or so Union riflemen shooting back at the ship from the shore. His men warned him that he was needlessly putting himself in danger, but he ignored them in his anger, and this ended up leading to his own tragedy. 
One of the shots from a Union marksman caught Buchanan in his left thigh, knocking him out of commission. His men had to carry him back down below decks to safety. Lieutenant Jones now took command of the Virginia due to Buchanan's injury. The sun was slowly setting as the time now reached around 5 p.m. After thoroughly tearing apart the Congress and leaving it ablaze, the Confederate ironclad now turned its sights on the next nearest ship, the Minnesota, which had also run aground similar to the Congress. As the sun slowly set and darkness spilled into the sky, the flames engulfing the Congress lit up the darkness with jumping, frantic sprays of light emanating from the flames of the ship. The cannons and gunpowder on board the Congress began to explode as the fires reached the explosive materials. Boom! 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 The roar and hiss of the extreme fire and explosions highlighted the destruction that the ironclad left in its wake as it sailed onward to the next target. The Confederate ships Jamestown and Patrick Henry had already been engaging the USS Minnesota, and the Virginia was looking to join the fight. As the ironclad drew closer to the enemy ship, the Virginia's pilots realized that there was no safe way to sail within a reasonable firing range of Minnesota without the risk of running aground themselves. Keep in mind that much of the ironclad was underwater, increasing the risk of damage from running aground. The Confederates' possibility of also losing their only superweapon in the opening battle would be a devastating blow to the South's ability to win the war. The ironclad could not get closer than a range of around one mile to the enemy ship, but they continued to fire their cannons to see if any of the shots could ring true. The Virginia continued to fire as the night wrestled control of the sky from the day, and the lack of visibility prevented the Virginia from continuing her shots at the enemy as they couldn't locate her through the blanket of darkness. Looking down the iron sights of the cannons, the men could only see black. There was no way to zoom in or remove the shroud of darkness as night came upon them. It is not like modern militaries where there is night vision and infrared and radar. Once you can't see the enemy down your sights, you can't hit the enemy, and this would usually end the battle. In the end, 11 shots from the day's onslaught were able to hit the Minnesota, killing around 3 men and injuring others. The Virginia turned and headed for the mouth of the Elizabeth River for shelter until the next morning, as nightfall meant that there was little to see and be able to fight in the dark. Once arriving in a safe position around 8 p.m. with the Confederate shore batteries of cannons at Sewell's Point near the mouth of the river protecting them, the ship set anchor and ended the day's battle. Behind them, in Hampton Roads, were the wrecks of two mighty Union warships completely taken out of commission. On the Cumberland, which had been sunk by the Virginia, around 150 of the original 376 men were killed or wounded. The crew of the Congress suffered losses of 136 killed or wounded of the original 434-man contingent on the ship. The remaining crew of the ship were picked up by boats ferrying men to safety on the shore from the burning wreckage. After the battle, the Confederate ironclad had only two men killed and eight wounded of a crew of about 320. Think about how one-sided this fight was. In naval warfare of the time period, two wooden ships would usually blast away at each other for hours and suffer heavy casualties on both sides. The entire fleet of accompanying Confederate vessels had casualties reporting in of only 17 men. This compared to the Union Navy with around 286 casualties. The day of March 8, 1862 had been a complete, overwhelming victory for the Confederates. The Virginia had taken damage, but it was not enough to stop her from continuing the fight the next day. Two of the cannons had the front, or what is known as the muzzle, shot off, disabling the devices. The front ram had been broken off when it crashed into the USS Cumberland. Although the Confederates could not manually review it at the time, There were no less than 98 indentations on the outside iron armor of the ship where enemy projectiles had slammed into the ship casemate and the iron armor had protected the ship. The battle that transpired over the day proved to all those watching just how effective a ship armored in metal could be, and it altered people's mindset for how ships of the future would be built. During the night, many of the crewmen of the Confederate ironclad stood on the decks watching the burning ship, the USS Congress, still ablaze way off in the distance. The occasional cannon shot would ring out 
when one of the abandoned but loaded cannons of the Union ship would get caught up in the heat of the flames and ignite the gunpowder inside, launching the cannonball. Now imagine this setting. The night is dark. The Virginia is safely anchored near the land on the Confederate side of the river. A member of the Virginia's pilot crew is looking out far into the distance at the burning USS Congress. The light from the flames of the ship are stretching out across the water in front of the doomed vessel, dimly lighting the small waves in the water. All of a sudden, the pilot sees the outline of something moving through the darkness of the water near the ship. The dancing light of the fires only allows the outline to be visible as it breaks the rays of light emanating out from the ship. The pilot described it as seeing, and I quote, a strange looking craft brought out in bold relief by the brilliant light of the burning ship, end quote. The dark shadow moving into the scene in the night that the pilot had witnessed will turn out to be the USS Monitor coming directly to Hampton Roads to take on the Confederate Virginia and end her dreams of clearing the Union blockade and dominating the U.S. Navy. During the night, the Monitor finally arrived on the scene after her journey from New York and passed by the burning ship of her fellow Union countrymen as they prepared to get set up for the battle coming the next day. It must have been a sobering yet heart-pounding moment passing by the burning ship as the crew members of the Monitor knew that they would now be taking on the Confederate superweapon that had already caused so much damage to the Union Navy in Hampton Roads. The Battle of the Titans is about to begin. And that concludes part three of our Ironclads of the Civil War series. Come join the fight in part four of the series where we will be getting into the epic battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack. If you enjoyed the episode or you would like to help out the show, please head over to the website at sparkhistory.com where you can listen to our other shows as well as support the production. Again, that is sparkhistory.com. Spark History, bringing the past to light. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.